All right, let's begin. The first, what I wanted to talk about this morning was basically the theme of the conference and how it relates to the church. Um, some basic points were Jesus Christ is the Alpha and the Omega, and uh, um, He is, praise God, Alpha and Omega, and the conference based on Revelation 1.8, as I mentioned already, and uh, reminded in Revelation 1, verses 4 to 8, um, to John, says, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace um, be unto you, and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, and him that washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests, praise God, and to God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh, praise God, the good news, he cometh with clouds, every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Um, we notice there in verse 18 of Revelation uh, that I am he that liveth and was dead and will am alive forevermore. Amen. Have the keys of hell and of death. You know, the most important thing person to know in the whole universe is the one who has the keys of hell and, and of death, who is the Alpha in the Omega. If you know Jesus Christ, who is the beginning and the ending, the Alpha and the Omega, has the keys of death and of hell, you're in a good position to be in. And the Bible says that that is the only position to be in if you want to go to heaven. And uh, we're reminded that the context of this is direct reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no doubt here about who Jesus Christ is except God Almighty. He's not just a prophet or a man or a good teacher. He is the Almighty. Reminded that so many times in the Scriptures, I went through my, my Bible, wrote and un highlighted Lord Jesus Christ wherever I could see it, and He's referred to so many times as the Lord Jesus Christ. He is God Almighty. And verse 5 of Revelation clarifies that, that um, and from Jesus Christ in Revelation uh, 1, 5, and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. Praise God for that. So, he's the first. first he's, the points we're reminded here is uh, he is our faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, and the I mean the first fruits of the resurrection. Because he rose, we will rise with him also. He's the prince of the kings of the earth. He's the king of all kings, and he loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And that's the good news. He is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. I was reminded in Hebrews 10.7 that the Bible itself is, uh, it says, in the volume of the book it is written of me, in Hebrews 10.7, in Psalm 47, um, it is written of me. Who is it written of? Of Jesus Christ. From Genesis to Revelation, we have a testimony of our Lord Jesus Christ, that He is not just a teacher, um, not just a prophet, but the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending. And John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And that, uh, I can't get around that. I have to come to the conclusion there that Jesus Christ is God. Uh, clearly, He was in the world. The world was made by Him, and the world, but the world knew Him not. Genesis 1, 1 reminds us, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Um, that is Jesus Christ, creator of the heavens and the earth, God the Son. Reminded in Genesis so many times where God said, and we're reminded in, in Genesis 1 1, the Word was with God and the Word was God. It's reminded in Genesis where it says, um, and God said, it reminds us of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's so many references uh, in the scriptures about who Jesus is. He is God Almighty. What are the Jehovah's Witnesses thinking about? Agnostics, the Scriptures are clear that Jesus Christ is the Alpha and the, and the Omega. He started the beginning of time by His eternal Word and uh, revealed Himself to the children of Israel and still is revealing Himself to the children of Israel and is revealing Himself also through 
the church and will finish all things upon his glorious return. So just some references to encourage us of who Jesus Christ is. We trust in him. We know him. We know him that is the Alpha and the Omega. And Romans 4, 17 says, God who quickeneth the dead and call up those things which be as though they were. That's the person to know. The person to know is the one who calls those things which be as though they were. He knows the beginning and the ending. Um, Jesus Christ also is the Alpha and Omega of origins. And I mentioned it already. Uh, what a, a very important topic for the church to understand what the Bible says in Genesis about origins. It's critical to understanding of the whole Bible. We must understand origins clearly. When I first got saved, I was introduced to the gap theory and um, the pre-Adamic race and that sort of thing. And uh, praise God that the Lord revealed to me that just simply not pro possible. There's no death and suffering before Adam and Eve. So uh, what do we see in creation? We do not see everything creating itself from nothing. And the point is here is that the you know, importance of understanding biblical truth regarding creation. We see God said, this is the obvious observation, and Spike's going to spend a lot of time uh, revealing this to us, and, and uh, in his way, the reality of this, that uh, an importance of origins. And uh, we can go out of our way to avoid it with false science, but in the end, if we reject this clear revelation, it will haunt you for eternity. Um, but we understand about oranges is critical uh, regarding in context to the whole Bible. Some would say the first six chapters of Genesis is just poetry, and that if Adam and Eve weren't real people, then we got a big problem. There's no real sin. So how we understand origins is critical. That God said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In Romans 1.20, for the invisible things of Him, that is Jesus Christ, from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, those the rejectors of the obvious. And that was me at one time. I was a rejector of the obvious. I wasn't born a Christian. Uh, you have to come to Christ and repent and believe the gospel message. Evolution leads to anarchy and every evil work. And we see it in our society today. We see it in our public school systems. We see it in the news, so on and so forth. According to evolutionary teaching, moral thoughts are nothing more than chemical reactions in your brain. So if good and evil are simply chemical reactions in your brain, um, we've got a problem, right? And uh, Dawkins, you know, Dawkins who wrote The God Theory, um, he declares, if you believe in evolution, essentially there's no God, no morality, no right, no wrong. Whatever's right in your own eyes, as was in the days of Noah, the thoughts of the heart were only continually evil. And certainly we can see that in the world today, the conditions of the world that we're moving in, I believe, into the last days. We're not doomsed. I was talking to Kirk here. He's one of the, uh, who's helped me out yesterday. He's a Christian. He works at the, and we we're talking about uh, evolutionary theory. And, uh, um, we're also talking about, uh, he's talking, asking me about the conference, and we're, we're not date setters here. It's not like a doomsday conference or anything like that, right? We don't set dates uh, when Jesus is coming again, but we can look at the signposts. We can look at the indicators that uh, point us to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and the uh, prevalence of evolutionary thought in our society, I believe, is a strong indicator of, uh, of uh, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we see it in our society, the effect it's had on our younger generation, um, the uh, no respect for life. We see it in our public schools, what's happening there. It's a terrible situation that's going on there. But, as, and it was at the day of the Sodom and Gomorrah, when Jesus Christ is Alpha and Omega, evolutionary thought is a clear rejection of revealed truth. So, we have two worldviews we can choose as far as Jesus is, is, the, is the Alpha in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, or we can believe everything from nothing. Simple to complex. We're a result of random chance processes and no absolutes. That's a big problem. I was at in Cypress Hills at the observatory in Cypress Hills, and they had, uh, was it um, Isaac Asimov? Or oh, Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan. And they have introductory thought, and they showed a picture of our galaxy, from Milky Way galaxy, and they've had a little arrow pointing to our earth and referring to how insignificant our planet is in the cosmos, so the expanse of the universe. And, 
as I was leaving a young girl, maybe eight or nine, said, what a sad story that was. And, uh, and it is really a sad story if, uh, if you believe that. There is no hope. We're just ra a product of random chance processes. And you can't believe both. Theistic evolution doesn't work either. God did not use evolution. Um, there's no evidence of that. We don't need to believe that. Uh, we can believe the Bible with confidence. And there's so many reputable scientists today, so many ministries, excellent ministries that are, that are defending origins, a young earth creation, that God did make the earth in 6,000 years. Jesus is the alpha. He is the beginning. And we can be confident in that. Um, God is also everything in between Alpha and Omega. That's good to know, to know also, right? Jesus isn't just Alpha and Omega. He's also everything in between Alpha and Omega. And that's critical because He didn't just make the earth and then go away and come back in the end. He is everything in between. He is in control. So when we say Alpha and Omega, we understand that He is in control of the nations. He's, in control, he's got promises that He's made to Israel. He's got uh, he's in control with how the nations are functioning, working towards the last days. So we're reminded in uh, the Scriptures, in Isaiah 66, 1a, Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. The earth is His footstool. He is in control. God guides the nations to fulfill His will because He is Alpha and Omega. God is never worried about the conditions of the earth. He's never wringing in hands and worried, wondering, wondering uh, what's going to happen. He's Alpha and Omega. He's in complete control. Men may sin and go on their own way, but God will have the glory. We walk by faith and not by sight. I put uh, faith, not positivity, because uh, I'm a Christian. I'm not a, positive, uh, I'm not a positive person. I'm a person of faith. And I, I threw that in there because I hear it all the time, even amongst Christians. Uh, are you feeling positive today? I, uh, I feel I've got a positive vibe. But Christians walk by faith, not positivity. And I find that faith is being re replaced by a positive mental attitude today. But we walk by faith, in faith in Jesus Christ, who is the Alpha and the Omega. Antichrist will change times and laws. We look at the world today, and I, that's why I think our coming is very, very close. We have a government in Canada, I think, that reflects uh, the New World Order thinking, world government thinking, and uh, maybe I think the thinking of Antichrist and Daniel 7.25, it says, And he, Antichrist, shall speak great words against the Most High. That's a sign of the Antichrist. He'll blaspheme the Most High, shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand at the time and times and the dividing of time. But the point I want to mention here is we see in the news today, we see an element, I think, of the changing of God's laws of the natural order of things, uh, people kind. Um, I've heard that before recently. And the news, people kind, uh, gender fluidity, uh, words like gender fl um, evolution, uh, Mr. Uh, humanism, false religion, and ecumenism. But um, I think that we see regarding gender fluidity and that sort of thing as a clear evidence of changing God's, attempting to change God's natural order of things. God created the heavens and the earth. His word will, is true. So people kind, gender fluidity, things like that, transgenderism, are, a, uh, are opposition to the word of God. They just need simply to turn to Christ. He has the answers. Jesus has the answers, the Alpha and the Omega. Do you know him? Um, you're, you can walk on a solid foundation, not the philosophies of this world. So humanism is prevalent, false religion, and ecumenism. And we'll talk about uh, um, in this conference a new world order as far as a one world religion. I think we're clearly working towards that objective with Rome. And uh, many professing Protestant church, evangelical churches are uniting with uh, Roman Catholicism and so on and so forth. So that's a great topic. I'm not getting into detail about that. But we see the spirit of Antichrist, I believe, in politics today. I don't know if you see it, but I, in my mind, I see extreme left-wing ideology as a, in my mind, and maybe I'm wrong, you can correct me on that, but I, I see uh, really the mind of Antichrist, what we see in extreme left-wing ideology today. Um, 
the mystery of iniquity does already work reminds us in Thessalonians that the that, 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 uh, spirit of Antichrist is uh, working in the world today. Um, but God is in control. But God is going to allow His will to be fulfilled. And um, we're looking for the rapture of the church. If you're saved today, if you know Jesus as your Savior, um, you're looking towards the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ when He comes for His church in the clouds. But the mystery of iniquity doth already work reminds us in 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 to 12, um, that the wicked one will be revealed. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, or is Antichrist, and God will send a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. The world, once the church is gone, um, all hell will break, break loose on earth, um, so to speak, right? Um, but we're working towards that. We see the indicators of that kind of thought in our society today, the changing of the natural order that God has established, the prevalence of evolutionary thought. Um, and I thought left-wing ideology today really reveals that type of thinking of anarchy, uh, Antifa. We see it in the news today everywhere, right? So uh, and I think what we see is Psalm 2, verse 3. They're saying, let us break their bands asunder and uh, cast their cords from us. We don't want what God has to say. Uh, we want to cast the cords of God away from us, of His Word. And uh, it's happening before our eyes. I don't think we can we can uh, avoid that reality. But Daniel 4.35 reminds us all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing to God. He's in control. He's Alpha and Omega. We don't need to, to wring our hands and worry when we see uh, the things we're seeing in government and New World Order and that sort of thing, right? We see uh, really large steps working towards a one world government and uh, and the last day's scenario. So all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing before God, and he do it according to his will and in the army of heaven. So that's an important point to remember. That's why as a Christian, we can, we can look at what's around us, but we don't have to fret. Jesus Christ is the Alpha and Omega. God is, is in control. The earth is his footstool, and none can, say, can stay his hand. None can stop his purposes, and what he plans to do, or saying, what are you doing? God is in control. Praise God. And that's, I can rejoice when I read the Scriptures and go to the Word of God, and I can rejoice that God is in control. Jesus Christ is Alpha and Omega for the nation of Israel. God made promises to Israel, and He's going to fulfill those promises, and He is fulfilling those promises. It's amazing. And He will not break those promises uh, we see a lot of um, replacement theology permeating the churches today, that the church has replaced Israel. Israel has no place in the prophetic picture anymore. But I want to remind us this morning that God uh, chose Israel as a nation and revealed His glory through them and will fulfill His will towards them, and uh, Jesus Christ will reign from Jerusalem. That's part of God's promises. And we see in 1948, Israel became a nation against all odds, there's Israel, that little plot of land in the Middle East, and it's a cup of trembling to all nations. We clearly see God's hand upon the nation of Israel. You want a proof of God? Look over there to that little nation, Israel. And uh, it says in uh, Jeremiah 31, verse 35 to 37, reminds us, Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for light by day, and the ordinance of the moon and the stars for light by night, which divideth the sea with the ways that are of war. The Lord of hosts is his name. If these ordinances depart from me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. So if anybody here can do that, just raise your hand now. I don't think there's anyone here that can, of course. And uh, God made a promise that uh, if, you can, uh, if you can get the stars to stop shining, the ordinances get them to stop, you can break God's promises, but only God can do that. And Jeremiah 3.17 says, At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all nations shall be gathered unto it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imaginations of their evil heart. So these are just words to encourage us that Jesus Christ is the Alpha and the Omega, that He is the beginning and the ending, and that He is in complete control, and uh, we can trust Him. We can look to Him, to His promises in the Bible, and we can see them being fulfilled. God doesn't work. Jesus does not work in a haphazard manner. 
He sees the beginning and the ending. He not only sees them, but He initiated them. He's in control of them, and He will bring about the conclusion according to His perfect will. That's why we can be confident in the God of the Bible, in Jesus Christ, the Alpha and the Omega. Israel's in the news all the time, and you can turn on the, the news, and there's Israel right in your face. And uh, a cup of trembling to all nations, indisputable. Israel is that cup of trembling to all nations. Um, uh, <clears throat> what God has begun in Israel, He will gloriously will finish. Jesus Christ will reign from Jerusalem. I'm looking forward to that day. If you're saved, you'll be there with Him. Amen? If you're saved, you'll be with Jesus Christ when He comes back in the New Jerusalem. Revelation 12, 2 says, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband, a New Jerusalem, where Jesus Christ is going to reign. Um, and geographically, it's going to be in the same space where Israel is today, and Jesus Christ will reign from there. So Israel is a nation today because God promised to preserve them and His promises do not fail. Do you believe that? God's promises do not fail. They don't fail. What He says will come to pass. I was recently in the news. Jerusalem will be recognized as Israel's capital. Wow. Like, that's amazing. I hope it happens. I hope it's a part of Bible prophecy that uh, Jerusalem will be the capital of Israel again. Who would have thought? Israel dispersed among the nations, brought back in 1948 as a nation, and now the capital, Jerusalem. Praise God. And Steve, you've got lots of other stuff. He'll probably talk about Israel a lot more than I know. But just to encourage us that God is, uh, Jesus Christ is the Alpha and the Omega. He is in control. Jesus Christ is also Alpha and Omega to the church. Praise God. So we can look to the church and He is... Uh, he is the beginning and the ending of the church also. So the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. As with the church, so with Israel, what God begins and initiates, He will conclude gloriously. God never fails. And, uh, but we do see in the Scripture, the Bible tells us that there will be a great apostasy as occurred of Israel. Israel had its apostasy. We can never look to Israel. Oh, man, they were so terrible. We can see um, the apostasy in the church today, the professing church of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a problem. Um, so, yet never forsaken. God never forsook Israel, and God will never forsake the church. So, thank you. How much time I got left here? Praise God that Jesus Christ is Alpha and Omega. Um, the Bible spends a lot of time warning us, warning us to take heed um, warning believers, we're talking about it at home, how much, how much time the Bible consists of just warning us of things that are happening, the dangers that we see in the world today. Remind that in 2 Timothy 4, 3, and 5, and last they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And if you're a lover of the Scriptures, a lover of the Word of God, you see it in the church today as an indicator of the days we're living in, that they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. But God is in control. Jesus Christ is the Alpha and the Omega. Jesus is coming back for His church before the great tribulation period. But the church will meet Him in the air before that. And we're, as a ministry, we are pre-tribulational. We believe in the rapture of the church. The Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 14 to 18. The Lord will descend from heaven with a shout. Praise God. I'm looking for that day when the Lord descends from heaven with a shout. We should be caught up together with, the, with them, those who have died in Christ in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So praise God that the church um, will not be here for the great tribulation period. That's a wrath opposed upon an unbelieving world. We can comfort one another with these words. There's a one time I was a, I was a pre-trib rapture guy. I believe that the, Jesus would come in the middle of the tribulation period. And uh, as I looked at the Scriptures more, I realized that there's only one time that Jesus could come, and that's before Jacob's trouble. And Jacob's trouble is God's wrath upon an unbelieving world and God's refocus upon Israel and uh, 
and the church is not appointed to wrath, the Scriptures tell us. The church itself of our Lord Jesus Christ, I mean, that consists of born-again believers, those that have put their trust in Him as repentant sinners. Um, Jesus Christ is not going to beat His wife in the tribulation period. We're referred to as the bride of Christ. That's why we can comfort one another with these words, because if we can look to what's happening in the world today, we can be comforted that Jesus is coming again before the great tribulation, that the church is not appointed to wrath, but to obtain salvation. Praise God. We should jump up and down for joy because of that wonderful truth that uh, Jesus Christ is Alpha and Omega. Jesus Christ is also the Alpha and Omega of His Word. You know, um, God inspired His Word. The Bible is the Word of God, and we serve a perfect God. How many people believe we serve a perfect, perfect God here? We serve a perfect God. He inspired His Word perfectly, and He promised. He made pro God made, you all talked about all the promises God made. And God makes lots of promises, and He made promises about His Word, that He would preserve it for His church to all generations. If God can't keep His Word, we can't trust Him. Everybody agree to that? If God cannot keep His Word, we cannot trust Him for anything else. So, um, his Word reflects His character. The Bible reflects the character of God. We change the Bible. We change what God has revealed about Himself. So, the Bible is the Word of God, but many professing believers don't act like they believe it. Um, do you believe the Bible is inerrant? How many here believe the Bible is inerrant? It's without error. I believe the Bible is inerrant because God is a God. It's not a God of errors. God is a God, not a God of mistakes. Where is God's inerrant word? Ask somebody time, sometime if God is, where is inerrant word? If they can tell you where his inerrant word is. Us as a ministry, our fall conference, we stood in defense of our King James Bible. As it reveals God's promise of preservation to his church and sealed with the blood of the martyrs and with the preserved stream of biblical manuscripts. So Satan knows this. If I were the devil and I wanted to destroy the foundation of the church, what would I do first? What would I attack first? I would attack the Word of God. So if I can take the Word of God out of the church's hand, and one of the popes once said, if I, if I can't take it out of their hand, we'll take it out of their head. And that's what Satan is attempting to do, to take the Bible out of our heads. Because they couldn't, they burned them. The, the Rome tried to burn all the Bibles, but God was in control. The Alpha Omega was in control. Um, he couldn't stop what God had initiated because God is in control. Satan knows that the foundation, if you chip at the foundation of the church you can, and change what God is saying and confuse the church about what God is saying and convince them that, he's not per that God's not perfect and he can't keep his promises about his word, um, then you can shake their faith in the Word of God. God is faithful. He keeps His promises about His, his, his revealed Word too. God inspired it inerrantly. Fortunately, we don't have the uh, originals here. We don't have the originals. Uh, we have copies of the original Bible. Um, we have manuscript history of uh, God's, uh, as God used Israel to preserve His Word he preserved it in the Hebrew, in the Masoretic, he preserved his word through his people. And so he has with he hasn't changed, he doesn't do things differently. His words are just as important then as it is now. So on and so forth. So Jesus is Alpha and Omega. He keeps his promises and his word. God cannot lie. He can't lie. He's not a liar. He doesn't contradict himself. God has promised. God cares about His Word, and God did it. I can't think of anything that God cares about more, I think, than His Word. It reflects the glory of His character, and lets the church know what's happening. If I add and start adding and subtracting Scriptures, we've got a problem. All of a sudden, God's Word is, can't be inerrant anymore. And uh, our authorized King James Version reflects thousands of manuscripts that are preserved, and uh, it's the only one that does, to be honest with you. Our modern translations are based on essentially uh, two manuscripts, the Vaticanus and Sunniaticus, and uh, 
And they're all changing. Why? Why are there so many English translations? Why is there 200? When's it going to end? Well, it's been a downhill slope to the Message Bible. And it's a sad testimony today that I, people go into church and receiving things that say the Holy Bible on them, and they're far from the Holy Bible. They're changing the way what we believe uh, about Jesus Christ, about the Alpha and the Omega. They're the, uh, taking away our Lord Jesus' glory that He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is God manifest in the flesh. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, God was manifest in the flesh. Most modern translations say, He who was manifest in the flesh. What do you want to believe? He who was manifest in the flesh? Or God was manifest in the flesh? God was manifest in the flesh. So all Scripture, not just some Scripture, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. The devil knows that, right? He probably knows it better than we know that. For instruction in righteousness. If we're confused about the Bible, we're going to be confused about everything else. That the man of God may be perfect. How can we be perfect if we can't trust the Bible? Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. God keeps His promise. He cares about His Word. He cares whether this church has His Word. And they'll never start producing Bibles because they make a lot of money off them. And I say this graciously because to make a new Bible, you have to make so many, you have to change so many words to make a new copyright. So to make a new copyright to sell more Bibles, um, they got to keep doing it. And uh, most of your modern Bibles are owned by Rupak Murdoch, which is Rupert Murdoch, which is a secular publishing house, and all they care about is selling Bibles, so-called Bibles. So Satan is, he's, he's, uh, he's hammering at the Word of God. He's trying to uh, chip away at the foundation of the church and give them a different foundation, a different, and I think we're, wor we're working towards an interconfessional Bible that all religions can be happy with. We're being programmed. In my mind, this is one of the most um, dangerous uh, attacks against the church that we see today is the changing of the Bible. Changing the promises of God. Critical to understand that God's Word is uh, perfect. Perfect. He preserved it. Well, He's perfectly inspired. He will perfectly preserve. Why wouldn't He? He's inspired it. Great. Is he going to preserve it? Oh, he couldn't do that. Do you believe that? That God would perfectly inspire something but would not perfectly preserve it? I think that would attack the character of God. So, he defends his, he's an overseer of his word. And he is, he is uh, making sure that we have a Bible that we can say, this, thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, not thus saith this scholar so on and so forth. Thus saith the Lord. He is not the author of confusion. He is the Alpha in the Omega. And Psalm 12, 6, 7 says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Do you believe God keeps His promises about His Word? He promised right there that He would preserve them to all generations who would have the pure Word of God. And Satan knows that, and he's uh, attacking the Word of God, trying to take the pure Word of God out of your hands and give you a corrupt one. They'll keep producing more Bibles because it makes a lot of money. The NIV, the NIV this, NIV that, the NIV this, the genderless NIV, the this and that, that, this and that, changing, making us think and line us up, lining us up with new world order thinking, with antichrist thinking. So, Two strings of manuscripts, one from Alexandria, which is basically was a center of agnosticism, and, or the Antioch text, which is our, our authorized version is based on. Thousands of manuscripts that agree. That's sealed with the blood of the martyrs, um, not the money of the merchandisers. So Jesus Christ is also the end. But that topic is an important topic it's, that I just mentioned about the Bible because it's one of the most neglected topics in the church today. Everybody's scared to talk about it. Nobody used to be afraid of that, to talk about that subject. 
But because Christians are afraid to talk about it, Satan is going to keep hammering at the foundation of the church. Jesus Christ is the end. Praise God. So he meant he's, he's the beginning, he's the middle, and he's the end also. Jesus Christ is coming to judge the world at the end. Where did the end begin? Well, the end, there's, there's the end and there's the end of the end. And Hebrews reminds us, God who at sundry times and diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. There's another scripture that tells us the worlds were made by the word of God as he spoke Thus saith the Lord, and God said, which was Jesus Christ, who being in the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person, when you look at Jesus Christ, you look at the face of God. He's not just a prophet, not just a teacher, but God. And he, He's going to, per, he, if we put our trust in Him, He'll purchase of our sins. And now He's sitting down at the right hand of the God and of the majesty on high. Are your sins purged through the blood of Jesus Christ? Maybe you're here this morning and, and uh, your sins haven't been purged through the blood of Jesus Christ. But it says, and that he spoke, in these last days, it's spoken to us by his Son. The, beginning began, the end began at the crucifixion. We're getting at the end of the end. And uh, the Bible says the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. He wasn't going to stand it for, thou, for tens of thousands of years. Um, God worked with Israel for a few thousand years. I mean, uh, he's not gonna he's not gonna wait fifty thousand years to come back for his church, right? We know already that we're looking at the indicators. The signs are there. If you look at them, that Jesus Christ is coming soon. There's coming a time of great tribulation, as I mentioned. The world's not seen since the flood, and praise God, the church is not appointed to. The wrath of God. They're not, it's not appointed to the tribulation period, but to obtain salvation. The Bible says, At that time, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, to this time no, nor ever shall be. It's going to be a time so terrible that we can't even describe it. The Bible can't even really give us, um, our imaginations can't imagine how terrible it's going to be at that time. We're talking. Spike and I were talking last night about the flood. When God sent the flood to destroy the earth, He killed everyone except eight. He killed everyone. Everyone was, He washed the earth. And, uh, and it says this is going to be worse. So it's going to be terrible. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I mean, you don't have to worry about it. Your sins are purged. We come to Calvary, we come to the cross, and recognize we were a sinner in need of a Savior. And uh, I'll talk about how I got saved in, in a minute here. But we see the birth pangs of the end, of the end. And I don't think it could be plainer. We don't, like I say, we're not doomsday called here. We don't set dates. But certainly we see strong indicators that Jesus is coming soon, and sooner than we think. We don't know the neither hour, but they are the signposts of his return. But the most glorious thing of all, I think, is and uh, Jesus, the Alpha Omega, as I mentioned before, he was made flesh and dwelt among us. What a wonderful picture of the love of God that Jesus Christ, who is God, manifests in the flesh. As I mentioned in 1 Timothy 3.16, God was manifest in the flesh, not just a teacher, not just a prophet, not just He, but God was manifest in the flesh and um, became the Lamb of God. That God, the Son, came from the glories of heaven, was born of a virgin, walked this earth, uh, raised the dead, healed the sick. Um, he became the Son of Man and went to the Calvary's cross, the sinless for the sinful. And we're the sinful, and Jesus Christ is the sinless. God's message to mankind is a message of reconciliation. That's the gospel. We talk about the Alpha and the Omega. We talk about all these things, but the critical message um, Jesus said commanded us to preach the gospel of reconciliation. That God commanded His love or showed His love toward us that we were yet sinners. Christ, the Alpha and the Omega, 
was made flesh and died for us. That's such an awesome thought. I don't think we can even grasp the magnitude of that thought, that the Alpha and the Omega, the Jesus Christ, that uh, was made flesh and mocked of men and nailed to the tree for us. Revelation 21, 6 says, And he said unto me, It is done, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, I will give unto him that is a thirst. Are you a thirst? You know, Jesus Christ today, are you a thirst? Are you thirsting for something other than what the world has to offer? Come drink of the fountain of the water of life freely. Salvation is a free gift. You can't work for it. It's not a works program. It's a faith program. Putting your trust in what Jesus has done at Calvary on the cross, that's the program. Jesus paid it all. He finished it. He said, on the ground, it is finished. We can't add to what he's already accomplished. No amount of works we do can ever add to what Jesus Christ accomplished at the cross at Calvary. He paid it all for us. The sinless, for the sinful, the spotless lamb of God, the Passover lamb. So have you drank of this fountain? If not, today is a day of salvation. Be reconciled today. What a wonderful truth. What a glorious truth. It causes, it causes us to rejoice. We don't rejoice enough, you know. I don't rejoice enough. You know, think about what Jesus has accomplished at the cross. We really should be jumping up and down for joy when we consider what He saved us from. We didn't just go to the dust. The Bible says that, and I'll share a bit of my testimony before I close here. And I was... Uh, <clears throat> I wasn't raised in a Christian home. Um, my dad can attest to that, right? I got saved first. I got saved. I was living in Winnipeg. I put my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. I was, uh, as a young man, I was heavily involved in drugs, alcohol, rock music, that sort of thing, right? Um, it was a long testimony, but um, Jesus delivered me. Now, I was in my apartment in Winnipeg. I was going to commit suicide. And as a suicidal kind of guy, um, if you believe in evolution, I mean, I'd be a suicidal kind of guy. Like, why go through all this pain and suffering? If you believe in evolution, why go through all the pain and suffering? You might as well just do yourself in. But I mean, uh, but people don't do that because they know that uh, in, the, in the back of their head that there might be an eternity there. There might be something other than evolution evolutionary thought. And I thought that way too. But, but uh, a friend of mine, my cousin, my, he was a partner in crime f with me. We traveled around, did lots of evil, wicked things over the years as young men with drugs, alcohol, um, crime, so on and so forth. And um, I was a very depressed young man. I got saved when I was about 25. Praise God, I got saved at that age. But I was a very depressed young man. I had big problems with depression. And uh, and uh, drugs and alcohol uh, helped me, I thought, helped me overcome that depression. But, but to my cousin was faithful. He didn't think I'd ever get saved. He said, Kent is beyond salvation. But he still gave me gospel tracks all the time. He gave me chick tracks. I love chick tracks. I give them out all the time. And it was one of the, it's chick track that was instrumental in my salvation. And I was uh, in my apartment in Winnipeg. And I was going to commit suicide. And um, the Lord brought to my attention um, a gospel tract, a chick tract called The Beast. Have you ever read it? Anyway, as I read through it, the Lord Jesus spoke to me and said, Kent, you don't need, all you need is to put your trust in me. And I brought me to this gospel tract. And uh, as I looked at it, the Lord spoke to me, and I knew that if I died that day, I would perish in hell. And there is a hell. Hell is a real place. And, I, and uh, the Bible says that in hell, let's see if I can get the sound bite here, that, um, let's see if I can get that, that uh, there should be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. I tried to imitate what it was like to weep and wail your gnash your teeth, but the Bible says in hell there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. It's eternal separation from God with no hope of escape. There's no purgatory. You don't just purge your sins and go to heaven when you're in hell. It's forever. It's forever. You're there. And I knew the Lord impressed upon my heart 
that if I died that night, I was going to go to hell. The place of eternal separation from God um, where you weep and wail and gnash your teeth for all eternity. That's a terrible thought, right? A terrible thought. Why would God send people to hell? Because of sin. Sin separates man from God, but we talked about it already that Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, and the beginning and the ending. And I found this sound by you might find this corny, but it reminded me that if I died in my sins, if I can get this goofy mouse to work here. Think about that. Think about this. Be able to bring us to our attention how eternity. That's the one I want. That's the one I want. You know, eternal, hell is an eternal place. It's terrible. And I saw this picture in my hotel in Winnipeg, at my, at my apartment in Winnipeg, and I saw an angel casting a man into the lake of fire. And if I died that night, that's where I was going to spend eternity. Um, if we don't have Jesus in our heart, we're lost. And the next day I was a new man. Jesus changed my life. He made me a new creation. I rejoiced after that in, in His salvation. I was saved. My sins were washed away. All that I, I put value on in the past, I was deceived by Satan. He deceived me to make me think that my sin had value, but it was my sin that separated me from God and uh, would send me to hell, my rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Whenever you share the gospel with somebody and you say, I don't think that guy's ever going to get saved, just think. Think about you never know um, what kind of, what you're doing when you share the, put the gospel in the heart of somebody. Or give them a gospel tract. Tell them about Jesus Christ. That could be their stepping stone to salvation. And God could work in their heart by His grace. So, thank you. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ. You'll escape the wrath of God, and you won't stand before the white throne judgment. The Bible, Revelation 20, talks about the white throne judgment. That's where all the lost will stand who rejected Jesus Christ. But all who know Jesus Christ will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We'll be judged for what we did on this earth, our service for Him, but not our salvation. And... Uh, but the white throne judgment is a terrible place. And it says there, whosoever's name was not written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So if you don't know Jesus today, I recommend that you turn to him by faith. The battery's running low here. I think that's semi, I think I'm just about got to close here, right? Yeah. So, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and whosoever word name was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So when I got saved, Jesus changed my life, and Jesus can change your life too. And that's 30 years ago that I got saved. I'm, you wouldn't believe it. I know you don't, I'm 55 now. I don't look at it, I know. <laughs> but uh, that's 30 years ago that I put my trust in Jesus Christ. Lots of trials, lots of tribulations in between. It wasn't a bed of roses. Sometimes it was a, a board of nails. Sometimes the trials are deeper, but Jesus will take you through any trial that He brings our way. He's able, and because He's Alpha and Omega. And if Jesus is your Savior, He's your Alpha and Omega. He's King of Kings in your life, and He will keep you. He will keep you till He comes again for His church. He's faithful, right? He, we have a faithful God. But if we know Him as our Savior, let's live for Him. Let's preach Christ. Tell everyone about the way to be delivered from hell. And, uh, and that's what we need to do, to preach the gospel. I want to include, just conclude there and uh, encourage everyone to put their trust in Jesus and believe that He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, say after the Lord. I'm going to cut a little bit early, but not very much early. And uh, for the next session. Thank you. God bless. Let's close in a word of prayer. We'll just do that. And we thank Thee, Father, for Thy Word. We thank Thee for Your promises You've given us in Thy Word. If you looked at different aspects uh, of Jesus Christ being the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, we can be so, we can rejoice and that we can have confidence in Him who, who, who initiates the beginning and will conclude all things 
and is in control of everything in between. And uh, I know the rest of the speakers here will, will clarify the glories of our Lord Jesus Christ, that He is truly uh, in control and the Alpha and the Omega. Amen.